His life and his writings intertwined. He had a raw, terse, and honest style that has influenced generations. His books were burned in Germany for being a monument of modern decadence. A legend during his lifetime, he won both the Pulitzer and Nobel Prizes. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Behind me is the birthplace of Ernest Hemingway. Located in Oak Park, the home along with the nearby museum tells us about the early life of the famous author. It's a place that laid the foundation for a remarkable career. The house was built in 1890 by Ernest and Caroline Hall. Unfortunately, not long afterwards, Caroline became seriously ill. Taking care of her every day until her death was a recent graduate from medical school who lived across the street. His name was Clarence Hemingway, and during his time here, he got to know and fell in love with Caroline's daughter, Grace. They were married in the garden. Since the house was large with six bedrooms and there was only Grace and her dad, Clarence moved in. This is Grace's bedroom where the first four children were born. And in each case, they were delivered by their father. Ernest was the second one to come along in July of 1899. And as we'll see, the world in which he grew up and the world he eventually inhabited were in complete contrast. Ernest's mother had aspired to a musical career but about with rheumatic fever had left her eyes weak and she couldn't endure the harsh stage lights. After the marriage, she opened a music school in the house, gave lectures and concerts. She was so popular that her earnings topped those of her husband's, the doctor. But Grace had an interesting quirk. She always wanted to have twins. So she held back her oldest daughter, Marceline, who was a year and a half older than Ernest, so they'd both be in the same grade at school. She dressed them alike, she even had their hair styled the same way. She even encouraged Ernest to play with dolls and teacups. The ruse continued until the teasing at school became too great and the matter was finally dropped. There have been some great debates among academics about how much this episode affected Ernest and his writings. But Grace also insisted that Ernest take up the cello, which was the source of great contention between the two of them. But Ernst did admit later in life that the musical training did help with the cadence of his writing. This was most evident in the rhythmic structure of For Whom the Bell Tolls. Grace took Ernest and his sisters to concerts and plays, so he was surrounded by music and by works of art. His grandmother Carolyn had been an accomplished painter and several of her pieces adorned the walls. After the family moved from this house to another one nearby, a number of people owned this one and went through a number of remodelings. So how did the researchers know how to exactly recreate these rooms? Well, they had some help from the past. Ernest's father, Clarence, in addition to being a doctor, was an avid photographer and took many pictures documenting the rooms. Most of the furnishings in the home are authentic to the period and several pieces belong to the Hemingway family. Clarence was also a naturalist who organized outdoor hikes, practiced taxidermy, and introduced Ernest to the outdoors. Also each summer the family would travel to their cottage on Walloon Lake in Michigan. There Ernest learned to hunt and fish and gained a passion for the outdoors. Later on, Ernest used those experiences as a backdrop to some of his short stories. Here's an example from one of them. In the early morning on the lake, sitting in the stern of a boat with his father rowing, he felt quite sure he would never die. The other person who was an important figure in Ernest's early life was his maternal grandfather, whom he was named after. By all accounts, Ernest was a good storyteller and encouraged his grandchildren to create their own. But he wasn't the only storyteller. On the second floor in the back is a small bedroom. This is where Ernest's great uncle stayed. As a child, he had traveled with his sea captain father, and his tales also lit a fire in young Ernest. As evidenced by a story that Ernest wrote in the fifth grade called My First Sea Voyage. One time the sailors went out on the bow and speared a porpoise and hauled him up on deck and cut the liver, and we had it fried for supper. It tasted like pork, only it was greasier. 
So as we've seen, it was a household surrounded by music and stories and art and ventures into nature. But another influence was Oak Park itself, which at that time was a bastion of Victorian morals. Everybody in town was expected to live up to a high code of conduct, including attire and language and general behavior. Every Sunday, the family attended church. Each day, the elder Ernest gathered the family and staff in the dining room for readings from the family Bible and for prayer. It was an atmosphere of piety, temperance, and self-restraint. It was a community that would have a difficult time accepting Ernest's first novels. Ernest was six years old when his maternal grandfather died. The will stipulated that this house be sold and the proceeds divided between Grace and her brother. So in 1905, the family moved a few blocks away to a more modern home, one with enough room for a music studio for Grace and a doctor's office for Clarence. Today, visitors to this home not only get an opportunity to visit a beautifully restored late 1800s Victorian home, but they also gain some insights into the influences which affected the writings of Ernest Hemingway. He spent the first 20 years of his life here in Oak Park. His story is continued just a few blocks away at the Hemingway Museum. Here there are a number of exhibits which give visitors a complete overview of the famous author's entire life. On display are issues of the Oak Park High School paper, The Trapeze. Here, Ernest is listed as a reporter, and later in January of 1916, he had his first byline. The following year, he became one of the rotating student editors of the paper. And what were his grades? Well, in most of his school days, the school used a pass-fail system. A was acceptable, D was deficient. Ernest did get some deficients during the term, but he never got a D at the end of the semester. During his senior year, the school changed to letter grading. Math gave him the most problems, and when he graduated, his numerical grade averaged a high C. But when Ernest graduated, he took a most unexpected action. His mother expected him to go on to college, but Ernest, who had always been an avid reader, thought he'd had enough of book learning. He was interested in experiencing the world beyond Oak Park. So his uncle arranged to get him a job with the Kansas City Star as a cub reporter. Although his stay was short, the Star's style guide became a foundation for his work. It stressed short sentences, short first paragraph, active verbs, and the elimination of superfluous words. He later said, on the Star you were forced to learn to write a simple declarative sentence that's useful to anyone. He only stayed at the paper for six months. At that time, the U.S. became involved in World War I. Hemingway tried to enlist, but his bad eyes kept him out of the Army. So he volunteered with the Red Cross as an ambulance driver and went to Italy. While there, he was gravely wounded during a rescue for which he was awarded the Italian Silver Medal of Bravery. During his recuperation, Ernest met and fell in love with nurse Agnes Kurowski. Although she was seven years older, they planned to marry. The war and their love became the basis for his novel, A Farewell to Arms. Here's an excerpt about the nurse. When I saw her, I was in love with her. Everything turned over inside of me. She looked toward the door, saw there was no one. Then she sat down on the side of the bed and leaned over and kissed me. When Ernest returned home, he felt out of place in the staunch Oak Park community. And then came the letter. In the museum archives is the original letter from Agnes ending their relationship. In it, she writes, I'm still very fond of you, but it's more as a mother than as a sweetheart. It's all right to say I'm a kid, but I'm not, and I'm getting less and less every day. I can't get away from the fact that you're just a boy a kid. It was, of course, devastating to young Ernest. While almost everyone is familiar with his great novels, many are not aware that he was first a journalist, and a very good one. After the war, he became the foreign correspondent for a Toronto newspaper, and eventually moved to Paris. 
It was there that he fell in with a growing number of artists who gave voice to a generation that felt lost after the Great War, a theme that was prevalent in his 1926 novel, The Sun Also Rises. The book was not well received by his mother, who asked Ernest if he had lost interest in loyalty and nobility and honor. Then in his next book, A Farewell to Arms, he has one of his characters suggest that the Victorian generation was more concerned about high-sounding words about value than about the values themselves. Hemingway's style was very different from the flowery language of the Victorian era. So too was his approach to writing. He once said, there's nothing to writing. All you do is sit in front of a typewriter and bleed. He also said, my objective is to put down on paper what I see and what I feel in the best and simplest way. He continued his career as a reporter and during World War II was with the American forces in Europe. In 1953, he won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and the next year received the Nobel Prize in Literature. Yet during all that time, he never returned to Oak Park. Today, the Ernest Hemingway Foundation of Oak Park maintains both the museum and the birth home, attracting visitors from around the world. It's a chance to discover the early influences that would later become major themes in Hemingway's works. For more information about these sites or for times that they're open to the public, Go to the Foundation's website at www.ehfop.org or call 708-848-2222.